I've only got a little one. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Sega ranked. The first mini of 2024. And an Australian does what Nintendo don't. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Hello, chaps. Good morning. How are Morning. we doing? What, what what retro shenanigans have we been up to this week? I know what Chris has been up to because I watched his latest video. <laughs> Shall I go first? <laughs> yeah, go, then. go first. So actually, it's not your latest. You've bought one out since, but I watched your Outrun video, Chris. Um, <laughs> you finally shared your disgust of Outrun on the Amiga. Yes. So for anyone who hasn't played Outrun on the Amiga, which I think most people have at least gone on YouTube oh. to see how horrific it is, mm. Chris will take you through it. So go and check it out. But as an aside oh. effect, um, as a side effect of that, Chris, you actually made me buy Outrun. Because <gasps> well, the cabinet. No, 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 no. Because I have <laughs> I have memories of owning Outrun on my Amstrad and having that cassette with the music mm. on and the cassette yeah. with the game on. And you showed that. In fact, you put the cassette in a lovely old hi-fi that you've got and played the music, which was the best part of the whole package. <laughs> and it I watched indeed. it and I thought, uh, I've got to own it. And you've got like the big box version. I always had the dual case double cassette version. Yeah. And I got... the big box version looks like it came out for the Amiga and the Atari ST. I think uh, so. So, yeah. So I jumped yeah. on eBay, found one for a good price. It was for the Atari ST because I've got a lot of Amiga games and not so many Atari games in my fake shop. So I thought, let's let's get some more yeah. Atari representation. Even though most people with the Atari might have got it with the power pack, it was bundled in there, wasn't it? But yeah. it's a nice, it's not big, big box, but it's a nice size box. It's still mm. got the separate music cassette and then it's got the floppy disk with the game, which I will never play because it's atrocious, but I'll shrink wrap it and I'll put it in the shop for people to... um google so there you go you made me buy outrun you are an nice. influencer chris oh no don't ever call me that no that's not a thing <laughs> <laughs> and uh speaking of big boxes dave you've been um buying yes. some uh some knockoffs well no i've not these 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 are this is ultima 2 and ultima 3 in the same style of box that Origin released Ultima 4 and 5, and they re then re-released Ultima 1 in. These are fakes. They're fakes. They're not real. Um, these have been kindly given to me by Matchstick Dragon. Um, he's been talking to me for a while. He was actually originally inspired by none other than you, Neil, uh, when you were doing your box restorations, um, to create these reproductions these are his. Um, these are his kind of his, his first try of it, and he, I mean, it, they're, they're great. I mean, they're, they're great. You can't tell unless you really look, unless unless I tell you what the the giveaway is. You can't tell what they are. I know what the process is. Are we oh. sharing that, or is he is he saving that for a video or something like that? I'm not sure, and he's he's not sure either what he's going to do. He's not sure whether he wants to sell these. He doesn't want to get into the business of selling fake games. Um, I actually have these two games already. In both cases, the boxes are very distressed. In one case, the box fits directly into this other one. So for me, these are a way to to have something on my shelf that matches the rest of the boxes without me faking games I don't own. Sure. Um, I wonder. Um, I wonder if he could maybe sell it as a, a sort of a kit with a template because he doesn't want to be mm. selling copywritten covers and material, mm. but maybe. Mm you know he could do that yeah anyway yeah i'm sure we'll hear more about it there's arguments to, to to say well what's wrong with someone buying a fake box of it because if you're going to go and play ultima 4 now then the game's enhanced by holding the manuals and so on in the hand and he's actually got some of the manuals in there but the game's enhanced by having the box and having the manuals and if it costs so much to buy well yeah i don't see i don't really see the harm in it as long as nobody oh, ever uh, thinks yeah. it's real don't see the harm yeah. in it, but it, the, the problem doesn't come at the point of owning it. It comes at the point of manufacturing and selling something that you yeah. don't have the, the, the copyright or the trademark to. Yeah. Anyway, you've got your boxes, you're happy, and hopefully we'll hear more about that process at some point in the future. Um, Chris, you've been inundated with kind comments since you announced your departure, so much yeah. so that you're going to stay, right? I have been inundated, and yeah, I did think about <laughs> replying to 
all the, the comments as many as I could notice, but I thought somebody's going to get left out. So I'll just say it here. You know, I do appreciate every single comment I've read and, and seen, and thank you so much for your support. Um, uh, no, it hasn't changed my mind, Neil. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Yeah, no, I do need the headspace. But no, it really is nice to know that I have been appreciated in this slot. Um, so that's good. Um, other than that, I've been playing about with my Philips G7000 and Munchkin, the Pac-Man clone, which I think I may have mentioned a couple of times before. Yeah. Back in the day, I made a uh, a maze. I remember specific because you can edit the mazes, unlike Pac-Man. Amazing. You can edit the mazes. Yeah, it is amazing. And so I've tried my best to recreate the maze that I did as I was probably about nine or ten. I was I was very young, um, and trying to recreate that and, and play that again. So that's been a very nice nostalgic journey. Yeah, it's good fun. Will this feature in a future video that you're making? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good. So um, I did reply to someone on the on the subreddit to say, you know, who was thanking you, just to say it's mm. not the end of Chris. You can go and subscribe to him. Double O Five Agama um, over on YouTube, so you can carry on following what Chris is up to and get your fix of Chris. Um, so there you go. It and he will be back. Thanks, Neil. He will, we will, will be back. We will have him yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Every, yeah, yeah. Not every running week. away. Mm. Every week. We, <laughs> I'll guess we had a, every uh, week. <laughs> <laughs> we had a particularly long show last week, so let's get straight into the stories and see if we can make something a bit more digestible, shall we? So off the back of watching Chris's Outrun video, I came across this story on our subreddit titled The 15 Greatest Sega Arcade Games Ranked. Everyone loves a list, and this one comes courtesy of The Guardian and journalist Keith Stewart, who I believe has featured on the show before, uh, a regular in The Guardian with his video games column. Now, Keith says, at the close of 2023, Sega announced its plans to reimagine several of its greatest arcade games, including Crazy Taxi and Golden Axe, for current home consoles. It's a welcome endeavor as modern gamers reared on Sonic the Hedgehog may overlook the company's incredible heritage. So here's a gentle reminder of the greatest coin-up games in the manufacturer's long history. He comes up with the top 15 Sega arcade games of all time, in his opinion, and I thought it'd be good to run through them and see if we agree and see if any old memories come up for us as we talk about them. So I'm inviting you both to jump in at any point. Don't wait for me to finish this list. Just jump in if you've got anything to say. Stick your virtual hand up and we'll see where this get, leads us. So we start at 15, down to one, and at number 15, it starts with 1987's Afterburner. Now, uh, with Afterburner, that was a game that I loved watching the attract mode. It was a pretty nice cabinet. Um, I think they had the sit-down one, the stand-up one with a hulking great joystick, a bit like the joystick in Space Harrier and other games. And I liked watching the attract mode because I was into flight simulators, as Chris was, from day one of owning a computer. So I always got kind of frustrated with arcadey flight sims. They never yeah. quite delivered what I wanted out of them. Is Agreed. that the same for you, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. I, I I loved Afterburner, but it was it was too on rails. It looked great, but when you're used to open world flight sim, it was just yeah, too linear. Yeah, it was yeah. It, it relied really heavily on the super scaler thing, the the wow of the the super scaler and how that mm -hmm. that showed you nothing. There was nothing else like it in the arcade. Uh, there was no other games like the the the, the Sega Super Scaler. So that was what it, yeah that was yeah. What there were other games like Space Harrier would would be. The equivalent, you know, very, very similar yeah. to Afterburner, but um, not from not much from other manufacturers. No, nothing style. at all. No, yeah. Um, number fourteen, it's nineteen eighty two Zaxxon. Now, I didn't see this game in the arcades, maybe because I was a bit too young for it. But I did play plenty of home ports of it and other in, uh, games inspired by its viewpoint, including Viewpoint. That was a game and Highway Encounter. That was a firm favorite on my CPC with that. That same angle. I think you played that one a lot, didn't you, Dave? Highway Encounter. No, I didn't. No, I. Oh, okay. I, 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 I'm not able. I, I can't. I can't do it. Zaxxon is. Um, Zaxxon annoys me because I can't. <laughs> I can't do it. And you can't see how high you are. Yeah, with the height. You can't see yeah. it. You can't do it. I had the board Anyways, game with Zaxxon. That was quite good. It was a board Witchcraft, game. The board game. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was quite you see good. See how high you were in that. Yeah, you could actually, because you, you had to <laughs> raise this thing to raise the ships up as you approach the. Uh, it's quite quite a good board game, actually. Anyway, yeah, moving that's, on. That's what I thought when I played the arcade game. This will be a great board game. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they did Pac Man as well, but anyway. <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole episode in that, isn't there? Collecting <laughs> video game board games. Yeah, number thirteen is. Um, I've actually got. Sorry, I've actually got the board game of California Games. Did you know that oh, was a thing? What? <laughs> How does that comes, with a, comes with a VHS tape, and, and the whole game is it's one of those VHS-based games. There was a kind of a trend for them at one point. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, and I've got another VHS based game, which is based on um, winter games. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the video game, winter games, is, is an ocean branded board game. Anyway, uh, number 13, we've gone well off track there. Virtua Racer. So I remember the day when Virtua Racer arrived in our local arcades. It was the full sit in cabinet. I think there were two, so you could go head to head. And um, the impact of this arriving wasn't just about the game, which was a good game. It was a lot of fun. It was the statement that Sega was making. It was saying, we are going all in on 3D now. This is the future. And I was all in. I was all for it. I loved Virtua Racing and what it represented. Um, so that was a good one for me. Any memories from you guys? I, 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 not really. I think I can remember the great, big, honking, massive assembly assembled cabinets yeah, it's beside like an each F1 other. Yeah, like F1 car cockpit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, Chris, they are- I, yeah, I played it heaps. Uh, they had one in Laser Quest in the lobby at Laser Quest, and it was one of those games where I was the best out of all my mates, which is always a nice thing to achieve. <laughs> um, so that was good. And then that was a—I think it was, must have been a stand-up one, or maybe it was sit down, but not a full F1 thing. Can't quite remember, but I do remember in Lakeside Thurrock they had a full sit-down one, and it had these things that were push into your ribs to kind of simulate G around the corners, as if you're being oh, pushed into the opposite yeah. side of the car. And it was really annoying. Like it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't the same as hydraulics. It was just rubbish. But the game was fantastic. But anyway. Sure, it wasn't your mates just pushing you. <laughs> it might have been. Might have been. Number 12 is The Last Bronx. Now I can't say I've played this a lot. I do remember it in my arcade. It's a 3D fighter from 1996. Um it was it sort of carried on the intent signaled by Virtua Fighter, Sega's first 3D fighter. And it took it to the next level with texture mapping, more detailed models. I think I was just a bit bored by fighters by that point. I I'm judging by your silence that you, you guys didn't really I I, I was bored by fighters within five minutes of Street Fighter 2. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, number 11, 1987's Alien Syndrome, which Keith describes mm. as Gauntlet meets Aliens. And we saw plenty of home ports inspired by this, um, including, well, it, it did get it, an official port, didn't it? But we also had Alien Breed. We had Day, Die Alien Slime, which I have to mention because Jason of the Dev Den wrote that <laughs> for the Amstrad. It's um, a great name for a game, isn't it? That, that was inspired by uh, Alien Syndrome. Um, again, I remember it there. I don't remember putting a lot of money into it um, because it was a good game. 87. I don't know. I just felt like I was getting that kind of fix at home. It didn't didn't bring anything new to the table for me. But maybe again, by the time I was playing, it was probably a couple of years older anyway. So that's probably the reason. Didn't get the, the full impact of it arriving on day one. Number 10, Light Gun Shooter House of the Dead 2. That's from the late 90s. Um, yeah, I mean light gun shooters evolved to that full 3d still on rails but not the early not the earlier type fmv games where you knew exactly what was going to happen when pretty much i didn't play this one i played house of the dead but house mm. of the dead was good fun it really it was, was good, good. It, it was good it was just yeah, operation wolf with better technology um I, I, I like the way in the 3d shooters how the uh enemies reacted to depend on where you shot yeah. them that was good yeah. fun yeah, yeah. Mm. Number nine. We are at number nine, aren't we? Yes, Space yeah. Harrier. It's in there. Another super scalar game from 1987. Our, our arcade never had the hydraulic machine, but it was still fun nonetheless. And you had that welcome to the fantasy zone at the start. That will forever ring in my head. Um, number eight, Crazy Taxi from 1999. Now, by the time my local arcades were dying in 99 when this came out so this is a game that i associate really with the dreamcast with motorway service stations because it was always in them and it was always alongside silent scope for a period if you remember that those two were always in service stations um it was always expensive in service stations to play arcades and it always felt a bit dirty no it was it was free because my parents paid <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> is it, this, is, this is maybe the only one that I feel is on the list because of its strength on the consoles. Yeah. If it didn't get the console port, would it be on this list? I, mm. What was, I, was, I, was the, um, what was the truck driving game as well from Sega? Was it? Oh, what was that called? Oh, I don't know that. 18 oh, Wheeler, something like I that. I remember seeing that. Yeah. I've, I'd forgotten about that. That was also in the service station. Um, 
Big rich. Imagine truck drivers getting out of their HGVs, knacker going in for something to eat and saying, I know what I want to do, drive a truck. Yeah, Fun. it's called 18 Wheeler American Pro Trucker. And it had the great big American <laughs> truck steering wheel. I remember that in the service stations as well. Um, and, and again, that was on the Dreamcast as well. It was good fun on the consoles. Anyway, uh, number seven, Golden Axe. Had to be in the list, didn't it? 1989, one of my favorite games to play two-player in an arcade because you can quickly play through it, have a nice chat. Wait, it's quite a social game to play. Um, and it's not too hard to do on... You can, you can one credit it. It's a great game. It's one of the best games ever made, I think. It should be number one in this list, perhaps. Oh, okay. It's mm. get the, the whole... The whole ambience of the game, the music, the sound, the grunts, everything about it, it, it it's its a game I wanted to play before I even knew it existed, if you know what I mean. It, it's kind of a the whole fantasy setting. Yeah. It hadn't been done before. Um, amazing game. Absolutely amazing game. Is it maybe my favourite Sega game? I, I, I can't think of one that's... Uh, when it stands out more it just ever everything hit right at just the right time the whole conan and the whole D D thing amazing game lovely game. great music and and some really good home ports as well so we all got to enjoy that in one way yeah or i mean the the atari st port of it there's one i had and if you'd asked me i would say it was atari it was arcade perfect yeah it's absolutely not but it's great fun to play at home and it feels just like it uh, number six, Virtua Cop, so very much like House of the Dead, but earlier, the same, um, you know, shoot, shoot the guys in the knees, watch them clutch their knee. I would personally always choose Point Blank as the light gun shooter for me. That's mm. a Namco game um, in the arcades because I really love the two-player aspect of that. But Virtua Cop, absolutely fine up there. Uh, number five, I would probably put this behind Golden Axe personally, Shinobi, 1987. Mm. Um, or I might even pick Shadow Dancer, the, the sequel over this. Shinobi, I, I, I remember playing it at the airport because there was nothing else to play, and just I just didn't like it that much. I always found it a bit frustrating, a bit yeah. a bit cheap. Um, I like it on the consoles, but I just found it took my money too easily. Maybe I'm just not a good enough player. Anyway, number four, it had to be in there. Outrun. What's that? Never heard of it. <laughs> number Moving four. On. Um, I don't think we need to say much about Outrun other than it should be higher. Uh, Number three, Sega Sega Rally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Um, Now, it's a good game. It's a game that got the feel of the car so right for me. And I don't mean accurate. I just mean that just right for fun. It was like driving on butter. It was so good. And it still holds up today. You know, even even the graphics hold up pretty well in the old cabinets today. I I know it's you know what is it 20 years old plus 25 years old but it still holds up well for me today and it's great fun to play was it one of the first Go on. that had the h pattern shifter i know i know obviously you had hard driving by atari but i'm trying to think of other games that actually had an h pattern shifter mm, for the gears a question for the viewers yeah rather than yeah. just high and low which most other things did i just remember it being a a, a, a game for the bowling because it was too these ones were too big to go in arcades, so they would never take out. They would never take out a whole bank of machines like a great big bank of them just to get that in. So you you would get this in the bowling. There was yeah. a stand up um, yeah. Sega rally, but it wasn't the same. You had to be in the sitting cabinet to enjoy that. I, it had to be the two of you playing together yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Number I'll two, the bowling alley as well. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> That's all right. Number two, Virtual Fighter Two. Yeah, I played yeah. number one. I don't yeah. remember number two. I think those that were ever even seeing number two. I don't think any of us were ever really any good at fighters (laughs) or big fans of them. Um, And number one, check this. Keith has chosen Daytona USA as his number one Sega game of all Mm. time. It's not mine, but I can't argue. If someone says that's their favorite Sega game, well, Mm. they're not wrong. Well, yeah, it's a good game. opinion is yeah. keith's opinion it's a good yeah. game i've got very fond memories of about eight of the cabinets all lined up at my arcade i'm trying <laughs> to get as many people as possible to all play at once that was fantastic um but sega have a long and illustrious history there are so many games to pick from uh you've jumped in at various points just just give us your thoughts dave it is a good list. I want to get it. It's a good list. Um, I have very few quibbles about it, apart from the position of Golden Axe and the fighter games. And um, the only one, the only change I'd make is to drop out run and put in Super High on. Drop out run? I'm not being serious. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, Super Hang On, you would think it should be in there. Yeah. Super, I prefer Super Hang On to Outrun. 
Mm. And I'm not saying it runs bad. I just prefer Super Hang On Tower. I don't know why, uh, but I, 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 it feels it feels a shame to miss it out. But Super Hang On and Outrun for, for me go together, but in the same way that Space Harrier and Afterburner go together. Space Harrier and Afterburner, it's almost like a sprite swap. Um, it feels such a, a similar game. Um, again, they've got they've got Sega Rally, they've got Daytona, they've got. Um, what's the other racing game they had in there that's further up? Virtual Racer. Um, yeah, um, the game's kind of it's the same kind of games they've got in there. So why couldn't they fit? They, they could have put Super Hang on in there. And also, Star Wars Trilogy is a really, really cool game that could have gone in there. Um, other than that, no, I, I, I don't think it's a bad list at all. It's a good list. It's, it was well thought out, and it's clearly his opinion. But I don't think you could say it's wrong. I mean, how many bad games did Sega actually put out in the arcades? very few if any it was just but just we don't know them for taste really isn't <laughs> yeah. it yeah yeah chris um i think it's a great list i can't I can't think of anything that doesn't belong in such a list that's there or that i'd put in its place but that's probably because i'm just not thinking of the games i'm sure if you spout off some more sega games mm. then i'll probably start nodding my head um it's just that they're not springing to mind now um daytona at number one i mean i played daytona as recently as september last year at the palace arcade in Fremantle, and it was only it, you know it was only a you know a few seconds before I was already back to drifting turn three, I think it is the, the really tight turn with Sonic on the wall um, oh, yeah. on, on the main track. Um, and so it was just, yeah, it all, it all just came back. It's a lovely game. It's got a wonderful feel about it. Um, and a fond memories of playing that. Um, if, if I did change anything, I'd stick out run in the number one slot, not because it's necessarily, you know, my old, my favorite game as such, but well, that is definitely up there as one of my favorite games of all time. But also, it's importance. It's you know, it, it was such a turning point for driving games, in my opinion. Um, and and Outrun was kind of the yardstick for I'd say about a decade. Maybe I'm stretching it. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. But I can't think. You know, for ages and ages and ages, it was you know, can it either can it play Outrun? Does it have a decent port of Outrun? Or if another driving game came out, is is it as good as Outrun? You know, that's what we were comparing it against. And I can't see anything else on that list that would make such a boast so that's why i'd put out on a number one yeah i guess you're getting there into the influence and the impact that the game had rather than just the you know keith's enjoyment of the game dave yeah so if my number one is golden axe and chris your number one is outrun neil what's your number one it's probably going to be outrun as well i'm afraid yeah. just because it's the one i always go back to i just never yeah. tire of it yeah, I, I couldn't argue with him and put number uh, number one as outrun. Um, fair enough. I will put Golden Axe at number two, though. <laughs> Good, Chris. Where's, where's Golden Axe? You seen it? You see anything on another number two? You're off the podcast. <laughs> it's a dem- number two. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Oh, he's staying. He's staying. <laughs> Yay! He's staying. <laughs> Well, on the list, of course, there's no Enduro Racer, no Altered Beast, no Power Drift, Wonder Boy. Super Monaco, Radmobile, Dynamite Cop, also known as Die Hard, which I have a very soft spot for. That was in our local arcade. No F355 Challenge with its cockpit and three monitors. I think if you're going to put Crazy Taxi in, I think I would probably put that in in, instead. Um, It's a list that tries to span most eras of Sega video game arcades. Of course, Sega had their electromechanical games before them. Um, Although there's no representation of the 1970s video game arcades from Sega. They were making them way back 1972, 73. Um, Monaco GP was in the 70s, for example. That was a top-down racer with the cockpit. But you can't fit them all in there, I guess. It is a good representation of what Sega did for the arcades. Uh, We've said what we would put at number one. And, um, I mean, it's easy to criticize someone else's list. Maybe we should have a crack at making our own list sometime and take the flack that goes with it, maybe in a future episode. Dave? Top 10 Ultimus. <laughs> what? Let's move on. <laughs> we are sponsored this week by Pixel Addict Magazine. Thank you very much, Pixel Addict. Um, the, the new issue I'm looking at now is a wonderful cover of the, the cover story. Hmm? It's a toaster on the cover. Well, it kind of is, yeah. It's the the connection machine, which is a supercomputer that I've never heard of uh, that looks like a proper supercomputer. It's a huge black cube about the height of a person made of eight smaller cubes with these 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 red, it's black, shiny black with these red, almost like a matrix effect, like lights but in red. Yeah, um, no. Um, it appears to... 
it right appears there. to be the inspiration for many gaming PCs of the past 10 or 15 years. I never heard of it until I read this this this, this month's magazine. Uh, an interesting article on it, uh, weather predictions and so on it was used for. Lots of other stuff in this week's, uh, in this week, this week. Yeah, do it every week now from now on, Jonah. Every week. <laughs> every week. Uh, in this this month, even though it's like really edition, there's an article on Ginger Hippie yes. and the Pigeon Poop Ooh, Find. Yeah, something nice. you're intimately familiar with, Neil. I'm very familiar with that. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that article to see um, what other things he may have found in there, what pictures he may have shared, um, and, and if he tells any more of the backstory of who found it, who owns it, yeah. what they're doing it's, with uh, it. It's a it's a, a a storeroom that w- that was found where the roof had collapsed and pigeons had been depositing their messages on on it. But Neil uh, has have you done a couple of things there in the channel? Yeah, so via Simon Ginger Hippie, I've I managed to get the M eighty two, and then just a bunch of games here and there. So he would put them on Facebook, and people would mm-hmm. say, "I want that, I want that, I want that." So I would just buy them that way through him. Yeah. Um, but I still to this, I will always regret not being allowed access with a camera to film all that in situ. Um, it's just such, I keep saying it's such a missed opportunity for everyone to Especially see. Especially after seeing thing. Alex's recent video of yeah. A, oh, yeah. a, a not quite the same, but kind of um, a, a collector who passed away their collection and there was parts of it where water had got in and had been all damaged and he's touching these beautiful cabs and they're, they're folding down just because the the, the chipboard is, is gone. Right it's, away, yeah. yeah, yeah. And before that, Amazing. computer reset was a wonderful yes. episode in yeah. retro gaming history. So yeah. missed opportunity. However, Simon's doing his very best. It's not on Simon. It's not Simon doesn't own it. It's not his <laughs> warehouse. He's just been doing his very very best to get it into the hands of people who can appreciate it. So he's done a great job. And I look forward to reading that article. So pixel.addict.media, uh, you can have it delivered to you, uh, a physical copy, you can get it as a PDF, you can subscribe, you can get back issues, give it a read, it's great. I think the history of computing can tend to make the mistake of boiling things down too much, reducing the story to contain just one thing. So that means we hear about the Nintendo Entertainment System but not so much the master system. We tend to pick a winner and talk about that above all others. I do understand why, though. It's not really anyone's fault. Well, it depends what region you're in. You know, the master system was a winner, if we're picking that out as an example. It it wasn't a loser, but if you want... The the problem is, if, if you're going to pick, for example, a British micro, you're going to talk about the spectrum most of the time. Mm. And... You're right to pick it out, but what it means is that 10 people making the same decision pick the Spectrum, so no one talks about the Amstrad, and it ends up with some things being overrepresented. It's just how it is. It's not, it's not, it's not anyone's fault, really. Um, and today's story is not about one of the systems that gets picked, but it's also by no means a system that was simply and also ran a, and might have been a, a system that was could have, could have done it, but it didn't. It was a system that really, really was good. Um, it's a system with a storming library of games and a fantastic legacy. Listeners, you, you might know where I'm going, but I'm going to keep you guessing for just a little bit longer. Um, back in the depths of the 70s, when I was just a little bairn crawling about the floor, three mass micro, mass market and microcomputers hit the shelves. They get called the Trinity. They are the Apple II, the TRS-80 Model 1, and the, the Commodore Pet. These, these are the three kind of the original home micros. But just in time for 1980, the hero of our story arrives. It's a few years after these three, and it's clearly learned lessons from them, and it's got them beat all over the place, eight kilobytes of memory, four joystick ports, and with its famous antic and pokey, then of course I'm talking about the Atari 400. Atari, a legend in coin-op arcades and then in home consoles, entered the home computing market with a high-tech, powerful Atari 400 Micro. And who did the graphics chip? Well, it's, of course, legend J Minor, who sadly retired after making the Atari 400 (laughs) and took no further part in computer design. (laughs) Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to do the Amiga. Um, 
The Atari 8-bit line had a very long life. The original 400 and 800 models were retired a few years later for the beautiful XL line. And a couple of years later, that was retired for the XE line, which by then was becoming a bit of a budget machine. So um, people like to draw parallels between the, the Atari 8-bits and the Amiga. And if you want to draw that parallel, just like the Amiga, when the Atari 800 came in, it was groundbreaking and expensive, and it saw its final days as a kind of a bit of a budget machine. The XE line continued in, into the 90s, just into the 90s, limping over that line. And even with this, uh, an interesting looking XEGS console, that's the one with the great, great kind of big um, pastel coloured buttons. But I think the main reason we talk about the Commodore 64 more these days isn't because the Atari 8-bit systems were lacking. I think it's just down to how well Commodore were able to sell them. I think the C64 was cheaper. And I know if you wanted um, things to look brown, the C64 was better, but I'm not sure if the, I'm, I'm really not sure the C64 was better. I think it just sold more. A lazy, lazy attack on the C64. <laughs> lazy. Do better, the, Dave. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is the Atari 8, but if you look at it, the colors are very vibrant in comparison to the muted and subdued brown sick version of the C64. Move on. Move on. Um, <laughs> Have a go at me in the comments if you like, people. Um, but of course, it's many time. Atari have announced the new Atari 400 Mini. Or if you're in the UK, Retro Games have announced it. Retro Games are actually making it, and Atari over in the US are selling it, whereas in the UK it's being sold as the Retro Games, and it's been sold on Amazon. So I think if you're in the US, I don't think you'll realise it's not made by Atari. It's been made on, on behalf of Atari by them. I don't think that matters too much. Um, they are the same people, though, that made the Commodore and Amiga Mini. So they're using the same system of the chip, the All Winner H3. Um, really inexpensive, but powerful enough chip. And this time they're answering a higher calling and going for the granddaddy of gaming, Atari. I have to admit I'm not an expert on the Atari 8-bit. By the time I got my CPC, the Atari 8-bit line really wasn't doing very well in the UK. It was one of the ones you didn't see having lots of shelf space dedicated for it. It's only later I've looked back, lately I've looked back at it. And I had the impression before I looked back that it was a bit naff, that it wasn't very good. It wasn't up to uh, the rest of them. And it's, that impression is wrong. It, it, is, it is incredibly powerful. The release for this is the 28th of March, so it's only a couple of months away. You can already pre-order it on Amazon in the UK. It's £99 with a joystick. I haven't seen it on the US Amazon site. I think it has to be from Atari Direct, and they're selling it at $120. I don't think you can pre-order with them yet. You can go onto a mailing list, but I don't think there's a button to pre-order yet. Interesting, it comes with USB and their view of a CX40 joystick. I, I would, at a guess, say it'll be the same stick that you get in the 2600 Plus, but with a USB connection. I'm not sure. We'll find out. It's got five USB ports, so you can have a memory stick and four players playing Mule with the family. It, it does accept games on a USB stick, um, and it comes with 25 games, and it has a rewind cheat feature where apparently you can rewind up to 40 seconds of gameplay. Um if you're playing something like, I don't know, Bounty Bob and you make a mistake and it's frustrating, well, these days who's got the time to maybe rewind and cheat? Um, the games it comes with that have been announced so far are Berserk, uh, which on the Atari 8-bit has speech, Boulder Dash, Capture the Flag, Lee, Millipede, Minor, 24, Minor 2049er, uh, Missile Command, Mule, Star Raiders 2, and Yump. And while there's, yomp, while there's clues about other games and the launch trailers, I feel dishonest if I copied someone else's homework. I watched an excellent video from the channel. This is Pete, where he talks through all the games, including the ones that are not announced, but they are in the trailer. So if you want to know what those are, then watch his video. Um, they've chosen a really good variety of games and games that work well on the Atari 8-bit, and they, they highlight and define the system. Neil, is it a good idea? Do you think so? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's nice to see Yump on there. That's a modern game. 
um, that really shows off the system. So it's really fun that they included that. I like that. Um, I, I think we're at the point with these minis, certainly with Retro Games HQ, where it is, we're now into that cycle of rinse and repeat. Like you say, it's the same system underneath. They're making a nice injection molded case for it to go in a mini later they'll do a full size one a maxi i'm sure um it's the same inside uh that's not a bad thing you know it does what it sets out to do it's in a nice retail package you can go and buy it all around the world and if you're an atari guy or if you want to collect the minis this is going to tick your boxes fine if you want something a bit more dirty and nitty gritty and you want to get into the technical side you've got many options from pies to fpgas to all of those things so it serves a market it's it's great that it exists in terms of atari 8-bit systems in general i've really learned to admire and respect them since um getting them and and seeing that they really do have that j minor flavor in them in the way that it's put together you know when you see the copper effects that it produces on screen it's very very reminiscent of the same kind of effects i saw later on the amiga um having never used an atari 8-bit when i got my amiga it's really nice to see that lineage it is absolutely the precursor to the amiga that jay went on to develop it's a phenomenal machine for the year that it came out um but here in the uk it, it was hampered by that drive for super low cost even so low cost you build it yourself micros from the likes of sinclair you know this was never going to compete on price with those machines and we did see games on the shelves here in the uk i remember them but they were few and far between and they were relegated to the other micros shelf alongside auric games and dragon 32 games and all of those things yes dave i've just realized something like the msx it would have got the british msx curse the mxs was a power mxx was a, a powerful machine that got poor spectrum ports so i wonder if the atari in the uk got poor commodore ports because it just wasn't a big enough market and they didn't put much effort into it maybe that's why we thought it was a bit rat enough well the spectrum does have something to thank the atari 8 bits for manic miner was was inspired by um minor 2049 wasn't mm -hmm. it on the atari 8 bit so took it to the they're, next they're a bit different though a bit, a bit yeah, yeah oh, it's yeah. the same kind of gameplay just precise jumps and how to get across this yeah yeah they are but you know matthew smith himself has said he was inspired by that game to make it i have an atari 8 bit out in the cave it's an 800 xl it gets very little love from visitors save for the rare visitor who owned it and of course gets super nostalgic for it as we all do for the machine that we first have but i think that's a good barometer for how a mini will be received of it here in the uk it will be bought by the curious in the uk the completionists who want to buy all of the minis as they come out um but retro games limited remember they operate internationally they've got that tight that uh, deal with atari in the us which will do them fantastically well i'm sure um chris down in australia was able to buy the a500 mini when it came out in his local shop and enjoyed that experience so it's not just about the uk um i think this is firmly made for other markets for the markets that loved that machine first time around like the us and it's going to sell well in those markets so it's a it's a very good decision when you take a global view, I think, and I think it will serve them well. And I'm no doubt, I'm sure there will be a maxi at some point. And remember, there's that roadmap from them. There's uh, you know a promised um, another Amiga, isn't there, coming out on there? It, it, everyone thinks it's going to be the full yes. size Amiga. Amiga. Um, I, I would guess it'll be an Amiga 600. And now they're working um, with Atari. Who knows? What else? Yeah, mm. and that's that's maybe a big thing. Certainly, Atari have got their fingers and lots of pies at the moment, doing lots of things. But mostly, those things are good things. Yeah. Um, Chris, you're a big Atari fan. Is this up your alley? Will you be walking into a, a shop in Australia and fair dinkum buy it? Fair dinkum, mate. Fair dinkum. Look, it's it's not a machine I have any recollection of at all, let alone any nostalgia for. So I probably won't. But. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw an announcement from Retro Games Limited to say that the joystick will be available separately as well. You did. Yeah, so yeah. that is tempting because I, then I can use that on my emulation you know, on PC. I heard they don't call them minis in Australia. They call them dinkums. Dinkums. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Um, no. <laughs> but this is exciting. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reminded instantly of the fact that I got back into this whole, you know, rabbit hole of, of collecting because I saw a C64 Mini in my local EB Games. That is seriously what started this journey and uh, why the algorithm started feeding me um, 
crazy videos about people cleaning Amigas. <laughs> Who would watch that? Um, but, you know, so even though this isn't for me, it, it excites me because this will be the start of somebody else's journey. If they see this on even in their Facebook feed or on a shelf in a store, whatever, it can be the same catalyst as it was for me. And that's an exciting journey. I think that's a really good point you make, Chris, because we're so involved in retro now that we completely mm. forget, you know, we've we've perhaps feel like we've been there and done that with another mini or we've, we could do that mm. with a pie or we could do that with whatever. But actually, you know, it's a wonderful point of entry for people to bring them yeah. on board and to enjoy the hobby as we do as well. Mm. And that, that's what these things are. These things, you go into a shop, you pay a, a, not a huge amount of money for it. You take it home, you plug it into your television through an HDMI, and you're playing these games which are presented to you in the carousel in an easy-to-play easy uh, format with the possibility of putting more games on the side if you want to. If there's a game that you remember, you think, oh, I remember playing the Sentinel back as a kid, you can play it on your mini. It's a great way in, and we're, we're so close to it that we don't perhaps see how how high the barriers to entry are for people who who don't have these things certainly someone in their uh their mid 40s who didn't get into computers uh beyond their 8-bit stuff trying to get hold of an old machine and get it working that's a huge thing so that this that these that's what these are for that and, and yeah they're great they'll get people back into it yeah I was interested, though, to see the announcement because I saw the announcement from Retro Games. I didn't see it under Atari, and that did pique my interest because I really assumed Atari from now on would be doing the Atari products. Um, and yeah, the closest I can think that we've seen with the Atari badge on it would be the flashbacks, which were done by At Games. So it's interesting to see the uh, involvement from Retro Games Limited. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I think we all know that Atari don't really make anything now. They, you know they're, they're taking products yeah. and, and sticking their badge on that so this is another example it's just slightly higher profile because we know what retro games have made in the past yeah yeah mm. at least though they're not it's not just a rebadging thing where they're buying a generic product and sticking it on there they're being commissioned in partnership with with atari at least the 400 isn't my favorite atari uh, 8-bit mine is the the 600 or the 800 xl they have the wonderful kind of early 80s premium feel about them that that kind of coffee and cream look the standout among other micros the 400 looks a bit like a kid's toy however given it's got that really awful not quite keys keyboard if they ever do a full size atari 8-bit there's hope that they'll do the 600 xl or the 800 xl because if they have to have a keyboard, surely they wouldn't choose to have that that terrible thing. Um, and finally, I want to harken back to a story we covered last year on the team who did a homebrew remake of the Atari XL 800XL, which looked amazing. They were progressing towards launching it as a real thing you could buy, and then they got a cease and desist, and now we know why. Um, it's a shame, really, as what they were doing would be a dramatically different price point, and I'm not sure quite how much crossover there would be perhaps people who bought that wouldn't buy the mini i don't know but it's a shame we didn't get that yeah so that machine was the rm 800 xl by rm being revived machines in poland we discussed that back in episode 122 if anyone wants to go back and listen in april um 2023 that's when retro no, it was before April, but it was in April 2023 that Retro Games sent them that cease and desist. And I'm pretty sure it was at that point that we speculated, well, the future it has to be an Atari 8-bit Mini. Why else would they send them a cease and desist? So um, pat, pat on the back. I'm going to give you guys a pat on the back there for, for predicting what was going to come next. Now, after I watched Pete's video, I went on to watch John Hancock's the where he does yeah, the immortal John Hancock, <laughs> where he does a rundown of some fantastic Atari 8-bit games. So if you don't know the system too well, like I don't, if you're wondering, well, what's it actually capable of? Then it's a, it's not a long video. It's It'll keep your attention. It's worth a look to see just how good the Atari 8-bit could be. Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Housekeeping is short this week. Um, 
If you missed the announcement last week, Chris announced that sadly he didn't make the cut and he's going to be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> he's been on performance review. Oh, dear. Chris, Chris it, that's absolutely not in the slightest bit true. Chris has decided that uh, he hates us. No, Chris has decided that he, uh, he, he, it is time, after two years, it's time for him to move on. Watch last week's show for his reasoning. Um but yeah, in case you missed it, there you go. Make I'd the like to welcome. Make the most of him for the rest <laughs> yes. of the month. <laughs> yes. It's time for me to I'd go like to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to welcome three new patrons this week. Neil, not not Neil that's with us now, <laughs> a different I Neil, count. a better Neil, uh, Matt and Katrina. Thank you very much for signing up to uh, the Patreon campaign for us. Um, if you'd like to join them, if you'd like to become a twirler, then go to Neil patreon.com forward slash this week in retro where you can automatically link yourself to our discord server and your name will be pink magenta. not only do you support the show you get a pink name i mean what, what more could you ask lovely magenta it is a lovely color um thank you very much um i booked some guests in um I'm really excited about all three guests three of my favorite people are coming on once we um part sadly with Chris. Yeah, so after uh, Chris's departure, our goal is not to fill every week with a guest and always have three people. We're going to trundle on, Dave and I, the two of us, chatting away about the, the week's news. If somebody comes along that might one day be able to fill Chris's great big shoes, um, then that might happen, but we're in no rush to make that happen, and uh, we'll have plenty of guests here and there sprinkled throughout the show. Yeah. On to briefs. Um Following the mention of the cancelled 800XL remake, which was blocked by the rights holder, there's a theme this week. Retro Carly has let us know that Bitmap Books have been told by Sega not to release the eighth book of the Visual Compendium series, the unofficial Mega Drive Genesis of Visual Compendium. So this is a book, these, these series of books are, you might describe them as coffee table books. They're high on the visuals, really lovely to look at. They make, they take old systems and make, they, they show you, they capture how, how things really did look. Wonderful things. Unfortunately, uh, this one's been cancelled. Now, Sam Dyer of Bitmap Book says, as of today, I must admit defeat. I'm not prepared to risk everything I've worked for and jeopardise the amazing projects we have in the works. As a small business, we cannot fight something like this legally. And I entirely understand. I know everybody always says, no, you need to fight. You need to fight this. You need to fight this. But they're asking someone else to, to fight and risk. Um, Not just someone else. I mean, Sam represents lots of authors as well. Who's yeah. you know, He's making their dreams come true by publishing yeah. their books. And it's a yeah. real shame because it's a lovely series of books. There's a Super Nintendo one. There's an NES one, C64 yeah. one. Never had any problems before bringing these yeah. things out until Sega. That Sega have allowed some fan works in the past, but as far as I know, not where there's profit involved. But I don't. I, I'm I'm not I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal expert. This doesn't feel as if I mean this is this is talking about what Sega have done. This is reporting. This is documented. This is a, 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 a yeah. I, I don't see how they they can do this other than they've got lawyers and he doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And Sega do have a history of doing this uh, back in episode 114. I'm really diving into the archives this week. Uh, we talked about Sega taking down an art book. That was the Mega Book Collection from Bitmap Soft. That's not Bitmap Books, different company. And uh, that chap in that instance chose to just give away a digital copy of it for free and you could make a donation. I don't know if that's a, a suitable workaround from a legal stance, but that's what he decided to do. Um, and I don't really understand what Sega want to achieve by doing this. It, it's not the style of book that they make themselves. It serves only to remind us how much we love the Sega franchises. And there will be third party games in there as well. It's not all about Sega. So I think it only serves to damage their reputation with the fans, if anything. Dave. Yeah, I I, I I wonder if if there's any possibility of whoever's in Sega just now saying we want to bring these old franchises back, looking at this decision and saying this is a terrible mistake. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to happen though. No. Now Sam did say that he may release it as a PDF. Um, he's going to try and make that happen. I don't think he's talking about doing it as a PDF and then asking for donations as a workaround. I think it's just a case of well. I've done all the work. I want to get it out there. I don't know. So hopefully that'll appear. But 
it's not the same as as seeing those lovely pictures in your hand. Yeah. Um, what a shame. Shame on you, Sega. Shame on you. Chris, what's in your briefs? Well, speaking of takedowns, God, what a miserable lot we are this week. Um, so the Portal 64 D-Make has also been taken down on the request of Valve. Um, so thanks, Pajaco, for letting us know about this. Um, but let's not hate on Valve. Their reasoning is, uh, which James Lambert, the creator of this D-Make, um, he talks about in a video that he's put out, uh, it's because he's used N64 libraries owned by Nintendo and Valve are being cautious uh, of the possibility of litigation from Nintendo. So it's sort of preemptive. It sounds like Valve's legal team reached out and actually had a really real conversation with him to see what could be done. Um, But the end result was basically to err on the side of caution. Um, He's going to move on to using what he's learned to possibly make some brand new games for the M64 using open source libraries. And he actually sounds quite excited about the way forward. So it's a good outcome, but still annoying. Yep, same kind of thing. Mm. News for flight sim fans now. Chris, uh, a date is circulating from, from Microprose's anticipated remaster of B-17 Fly and Fortress. The, uh, ele- the EA release date, um, according to an email doing the rounds from Microprose, is the 23rd. Doesn't say what month, though. So I'm assuming yeah. the 23rd of January. Uh, this is the third game in the series that started out in 1992. But this one is a remaster, which is kind of what we already got back in 2000. It's not the promised version of the game, which is another version of the game that Microprose have been talking about, which will feature VR and online multiplayer game. That's the one I want. That's the one I'm really excited for. Um, I want to sit in a B-17 with nine other friends with our VR headsets on in different stations around the plane. That's the next step. However, this this remake... um, Apparently, looks like it's set to come out on the 23rd. Microprose is putting the feelers out to reward influencers for reviews. Chuck your hat in the ring, Chris. There you go. When you leave this week in retro, become a Microprose uh, influencer. Yeah, a professional um, influencer. So expect a flurry of reviews soon. Uh, I won't be doing one myself, but I will be following in, in anticipation of that VR version. Um, time extension says that two more people have beaten Tetris. So thanks to Lord Borat for letting us know. It makes me think like those great big long pieces you get in Tetris. You wait 40 years for one and then you get three at once. (laughs) Um, And something I spotted myself about modern gaming, which I was delighted with. I'm not sure if this is a surprise to anyone, whether it's it's always this way, but it pleased me to see it. Um, PS5 users, the PlayStation 5 users, spent more time playing single-player games than they did playing online games. Now, I've, I've nothing against online games. Online games are great, but I've always felt that recently everything seems to be developed for online games and single-player games were being abandoned until last year we saw the the breakout success of Baldur's Gate 3, which is very much a single-player game. Um, so I'm delighted to see things are not always getting bent and broken to be online. I think I know the reason behind those stats. So at the time those stats were taken, only three people had a PS5 and two of them were scalpers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just All you hear being talked about is, is Fortnite and, and all the rest of it. The so most it's, played it's... game on it, Chris, was eBay. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, not really dear. a single player game though, is it? That's definitely a multiplayer uh, game. Definitely a multiplayer <laughs> game. <laughs> oh dear. I think that wraps it up for our news in brief this week. What do you get if you cross a SNES, a PlayStation, an Australian, and an angle grinder? Well, you get the Nintendo PlayStation, of course. <laughs> Okay, so a bit of history before we get into this fantastic story. Uh, for those of you who weren't aware, and not everybody may be aware of this, uh, before Sony released the PlayStation, they were actually in a partnership with Nintendo to create a CD-based games console. Uh, keeping in mind, Nintendos were all cartridge-based at this point in history, with the SNES, I believe, being the current gen. Um, however, Nintendo pulled out, and Sony decided to go it alone, and as a result banked Nintendo's ass and continue to do so on a regular basis, in my humble opinion. Um, There's only one known prototype of the actual Nintendo PlayStation prototype, and it's worth more than a Ferrari Testarossa. That's the terms I'm going to put it in. Um, But not anymore. So a YouTuber (laughs) called Games for James has created one, a fully working one, kind of. Um, He took a 
kind of a working Sony PlayStation, and he electrocuted himself with it, first of all, and then he shoved its guts into the shell of a SNES. Uh, the images of the actual prototype show discs uh, being loaded via a front tray um, in, in the front of the console that kind of looked like a SNES, um, but a bit updated, and it also seemed to allow for cartridges on the top of the console. Um but for an Aussie bloke, that would just be safe and lame. So instead, James has, has made his so that the discs go into what would have been the cartridge slot on the snares, and they literally, 60% of the disc is still sticking out of the console, spinning away happily at you know, RPMs that would happily cut your face off if you get too close. That's how we do things over here. His tools of choice in this video appear to be a thick Aussie accent, a hammer, hot glue, and an angle grinder. It's one of the funniest retro videos I've watched in a long time, but he actually packs in a lot of good information. And the result is indeed a working PlayStation inside a Nintendo case. Guys, where to start with this? And, and also, knowing that Nintendo at the time liked to be a bit kid-friendly and a bit family-friendly, do you think the PlayStation library may have been different if it were under Nintendo back in the day? Yeah, so I'll do that first of all. I think if Nintendo had done the PlayStation, it would be much safer and much tamer. And the I'm not saying that all the kind of edgy stuff the PlayStation did has aged well and has hit the right note, but we'd have lost a, a lot of diversity in, in games because of it. So I'm glad that Nintendo failed in that part. Nintendo have gone on to being more of a... <laughs> I want to say casual, but that, I don't want to make people feel bad. I don't want to. I'm talking down. It. They've gone a different route. They've gone a. They've gone a different route than other places have gone. The video, though, this video is really cleverly done. You'd think the guy was an idiot. You think the guy was an absolute idiot, and he wants you to think he's an idiot, but he's not. I mean, it, the end result is there. He's really good at things. He's ripping stuff off, uh, but I think he's desoldered at first. Um, and I, I started watching it. I couldn't stop. I loved how he cut the trace in the PCB and his alternative to the Mugan and all the rest of it. I absolutely love this video. Um, it's a real treat to watch. It's that, that it's, it's real. I, I, I like the Australian vibes in it as well. This this is this is Australia in one video. Brilliant. I love that you picked this. I think with regards to what Nintendo would have done if the system had remained a Sony Nintendo combo. In, in one side of the argument you could say well just look to the n64 yes it was delayed because of that um breakdown and it took them a couple more years to get their console out for that generation but however in those two years playstation came out they set the precedent of what that generation looked like the uh, the kind of gamers they were aiming at the kind of games they were making so nintendo at that point then had to follow so you wouldn't necessarily have got the golden eyes and the you know the other um the other games that you got with the n64 if it had remained um, a partnership um i think both consoles have their merit without getting too much into the into the conversation i liked the fact that nintendo stuck to cartridges for that generation i did i really did um but anyway that's a whole other conversation in terms of this video this guy knows how to get engagement two simple words hot glue he yes. says that he says hot glue <laughs> about a million times in this video. So if you're triggered by someone hacking a vintage console, filling it with hot glue, turn away now. There's so much hot glue, so much hacking. It makes for a very funny video to watch. Yes, Dave. If you've seen someone hacking a console apart before, you need to think of a different word for this. This this is absolutely incredible. Yeah, so he blitzes it. He rips it apart. <laughs> he does. And um, uh, um, behind the comedy is, uh, as you've <laughs> mentioned, Dave, plenty of skill to make this all come together. I was thoroughly entertained. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the original Nintendo PlayStation concept. I don't recall the prototype having a spinning disc sticking vertically out of a cartridge slot. Um, but but it, it's a fun reminder uh, of what the landscape could have looked like, um, which, as I said, I think it would probably be worse if Sony had had been constrained by Nintendo at the time. So I think Nintendo go, Sony going out all guns blazing in its own direction with the PlayStation was the perfect outcome for everybody except maybe Nintendo, Dave. Do you think he'll get a cease and desist? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. It's too late now. <laughs> from the health and safety. He'll just, he'll just he'll get the letter and he'll hot glue it inside the console. <laughs> <laughs> he'll get a cease and desist from Robot Wars or BattleBots, because this is what this reminds me of. This thing would win oh, Robot, Robot Wars. Wars, yeah. It would so win Robot Wars. <laughs> it just looks lethal.
Anyway, I personally, on the on the history, I love that Sony went it alone. I'm not a fanboy, uh, but my nephew had the PS1, so lots of fond memories there. And I've owned the PS2, PS3, and now PS4, and I love them all. Um, but I love Nintendo as well. I had the SNES and and the N64. And let's face it, the Wii was awesome on release as well. And I think they sort of slid back towards not necessarily being technically the best, but just honing back in on gameplay and on social gameplay, which is not a bad thing. Um, and in fact, the the Wii has never been retired in, in our house. Um, but what I really love is a nice, funny, and yet somehow really informative short video by a bloke in a shed. So thanks, Oz Retrocomp, for sharing it in the subreddit, but also to James for this very entertaining creation. The only things missing, I think, were beer, a skimpy, and a drop bear. I assume they were there somewhere, but they were just out of shot. Time now for our community question of the week. So we asked in our last episode, what are your retro resolutions for 2024? Could it be hashtag play more in 24? Just remind me where that hashtag came from. Was that Retro Bear or was that you, Chris? Uh, Retro Bear was saying we should get back to playing some more games. And so I ran with the idea and came up with the hashtag. Okay, so you're influencing again with your hashtag no. play more in 24. <laughs> <laughs> Influenced by Retro Bear, but yeah. Do you have a project planned? Have you been putting off a project for a number of years? And this is the year it will happen. Maybe this is the year you will purchase that thing. You know, the one that you've been promising yourself for ages. Let us know. We are nosy. So um, no answer in the document from Duncan today. I've always got to check that. I've taken the subreddit, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro. If you wish to participate, I've taken that out of contest mode. And I guess I'll read the top one which is um, Lord Borak316, who's already had a mention in the show today, says, during the last year, I have slowly been... I've just had a pop-up. Did anyone else have that? Saying yeah, one, one new, new comment. comment. Was that was that you, it's, Dave? Did you? It's just too late to get in now. <laughs> no, I, I, I use the old site, so I don't get that nonsense. Hang on, let me switch it to new. Um Christ of why do you do you um so I'm gonna read this because it's coming while we're recording the show. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, so um Christoph Why do you says chip away at the backlog. I beat one more game than I bought in 2023 and set up my retro game section in the new house. We are moving into a rental house next month from a one-bedroom apartment as of March 2023. We became a family of four. Well, congratulations for March yeah. 2023. Yeah. And thank you for that <laughs> submission <laughs> while recording. Okay. Finally. <laughs> You're going to make people do this now. Yeah, they will. <laughs> yeah. So I've also noticed that the top answer from Lord Borak was submitted two days ago, but it says edited one day ago. So does that mean there's scope for people to uh, put in like a, a sensible answer and then just change it before we read it out, having got the top score? Yes. Play the game. <laughs> Please play the game. That. <laughs> okay they say during the last year i've been slowly been recollecting my amstrad cpc collection as sadly my original stuff got thrown away when my cpc went pop in 1997 and stupidly i threw out all the games too so in 2024 i plan on getting a good condition 464 chucking all my wife's bloody books from the study in the loft and making yeah. a zone for my cpc collection my wife says i have to shut up now i bet i end up in the loft but if I have my CPC, I'll be happy. <laughs> P.S. If anyone has a good 464 Plus with colour monitor for sale, please let me know. Thank you, Lord Borak. All nice. about the Amstrad this year. Who wants to take the next answer? I'll go next. Uh, Rickalicious D, building a retro arcade machine. Finally got to the point with renovating the house that I can use the tools for something more interesting. Fantastic. Good luck with oh, that. Good luck. Good mm. luck. Yeah. Um. Fizgit says, my retro resolutions trademark for 2023 was 640 by 256. Yeah, Boo. That had to this be year, we're upgrading to 1280 by 720. But he's, he's, he's put a, a, an attachment there, and it is an Amiga desktop with the usual Intel outside thing, because Amiga fans hate the PC. Um, and it is in 1280 I'm, by 780, that screen. Yes. Shot. Uh, I'm also going to fix the buzzing on this STFM so I can play Treasure Island Dizzy, but I need help with that. Well, good luck, Fiskit. Come to the Discord, ask for help. Perhaps someone can sort you out. Good. Other answers include Richard Shears says 2024 will be the year I stop listening to This Week in Retro. The devastating news that Chris is leaving is just too much for me. <laughs> I carry on, um, carry on. 
I am Amiga says, I will not be buying a single game this year. I will not be buying a single Raspberry Pi this year. It is time to actually play those games that I bought and complete those Pi projects that I started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all start off the year with good intentions. Um, <laughs> the hashtag. <laughs> uh, what was the hashtag on that one? The hashtag Goldie has got play more of what I already own in 24. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. I can really I can go with that. Um, Soldering and Diagnostics from Battle Pratt. Um, uh, Snoo Panda says, I fully intend to finish my cave and call it, he's called it Flynn's. Good name. Good name. Um, a colony activist, 320 by 200. <laughs> Lots of great answers, everyone. Nice. Um, yeah, awesome. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, what's our question of the week for this week? Does anyone know? I've lost, I've lost where I am. Yes. One in the document. Yes. I Let's make it. a list. There it is. I found it. What are your top three Sega games, not just arcade, Sega games of all time? They can be in any platform. List them all from us, and we'll check out your lists next week and tell you why you're absolutely wrong. <laughs> Outrun is at number one. So really, you can only choose two games. <laughs> On the Amiga. <laughs> Golden <laughs> Axe. <laughs> Thank you I'll so much, can only everyone. Choose one. <laughs> thank you for listening uh those links again if you want to participate reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro where you can submit stories you might like us to discuss you can comment on stories other people have discussed and you can take part in our question of the week if you love the show and want to support us head to patreon.com forward slash this week in retro where you can become an official twirler uh, thanks to our sponsor pixeladdict.media go and check them out and uh, discord.gg forward slash rmc retro is where you can chat live with the other twirlers and everyone else from the cave thank you take care subscribe smash that bell uh, like all of that stuff and uh, we'll see you next week with some new tiktok dances okay bye bye <laughs> bye <laughs> they're waving <laughs> this is our tiktok bye. dance <laughs>community subreddit at r slash this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show if you watch this week in retro on youtube please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers if you enjoy our show and would like to support it then please check out the link to our patreon page in the show notes or description thank you for listening and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech